Welcome, friends. It's so good to have you here with us. Let's start right away by lighting our candles. There. It's such a pretty little candle. I love how even though it's so small, it adds so much beauty to our time together. But anyway, it's time to review. In our first week of this series, we realized this place is a mess. And last week, we were asked to be part of God's cleanup crew. So we have acknowledged that things are messy. Our world, our lives, our hearts. And we have hopefully started working on the cleanup, clearing out our hearts and our minds, and making ourselves ready for the company that is coming this Christmas season. And now tonight, we are asked to deck the halls deck the halls? What does that even mean? We've all heard that Christmas song though, right? Deck the halls with boughs of... Wait, you know it, don't you? I am... Well, actually, I have my guitar here again, so why don't we just sing it together? Deck the halls with boughs of holly, la 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 Tis the season to be jolly, fa la 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 la. Don we now our gay apparel, fa la 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 la. Troll the ancient Yuletide carol, fa la 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 la. See the blazing Yule before us, fa la 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 la. Strike the harp and join the chorus. Ba la 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 la. Follow me in merry measure. Ba la 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 la. While I tell of Yuletide treasure. Ba la 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 la. Fast away the old year passes. Ba la 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 la. That song always gets me in a festive mood. Now let's watch Jenny and Tanner as they read our third Advent litany and light another one of our four candles. We want everything to look nice. The decorations of the season, our homes with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it is tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give you a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of the season. Not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things. The beauty of the heart and the soul. The beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Will you guys warm up your hands and pray with me? We ask you to meet us here tonight, Lord. Be with us as we hear your word and learn about how we can be light in the dark. Help us hear the ways in which you want us to deck our halls this Christmas. Help us hear the ways in which we can focus on the work you want us to do this Christmas. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, the true reason for the season. Amen. 
Deck the halls with boughs of holly, tis the season to be jolly. See the blazing yule before us, strike a harp and join the chorus. These lines translate to give us the traditions, sights, and fun of Christmas time. Decorate your home with the beautiful winter greenery and red berries of holly. It's the season to be super happy and festive. Look at that beautiful log burning in the fireplace. Should we play some music and sing along? Sounds like a beautiful and fun holiday, doesn't it? Why do we decorate our homes and our sanctuaries? It could be argued that it's to show off or to make us happy, to feel good about where we live and worship. That's certainly not untrue, but the real reason for decoration is invitational. We deck our halls so that when our company arrives, we can welcome them into a place that is beautiful and warm, cozy, and comfy. Oftentimes, we reflect our inner experiences with our outward appeal. When we're in a place of joy and invitation and inclusion, our surroundings reflect that. When we're able to understand the depths of pain and suffering of others, of the ugliness in our world, then we want our doorways to open to a place of comfort and beauty and welcome. Having reflected last week on our need to address this mess, we're now setting about bringing beauty and light into the world. We find ourselves hearing from, again this week, our old friend Isaiah. There are at least two moods, if you will, in the book of Isaiah. The first half, when things were going well for the people as a nation, was a mood of warning and judgment. Pay attention, Isaiah said over and over again. Look at what you're doing to each other. Look at how you're living. Look at where your money is coming from. And look at the foundations of your society. Does your community show the world that you are a people of God? The second half of the book of Isaiah speaks to a desperate people who have lost everything. They're hungry, they're afraid, and they're homeless. They're refugees without status or rights. And here is where we see the mood shift. The tone of the book is very different. What once was a warning becomes a word of hope, a promise. It's a call to live even in desperate times, messy times, by a different standard. In chapter 64, Isaiah writes, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, as joyous of a blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be recognized and honored among the nations. Everyone will realize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I'm like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding 
or a bride with her jewels. The sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise him. His righteousness will be like a garden in early spring with plants springing up everywhere. Things are bad. Take his word for it. Then Isaiah comes to these people and says, I bring you good news from the Lord. Good news for the oppressed. Good news for the brokenhearted. Good news for the captives and prisoners. Good news to those who mourn. Can you just imagine those people thinking, this is great. What is this good news? What will we receive? And then Isaiah answers them with beauty, blessings, and praise. What? Where's the promise of wealth and goods? Where's the publisher's clearinghouse van that pulls up with the cameras and reporters and a big sign and balloons and the good news that we'll be receiving a weekly check for $5,000 for the rest of our lives? Instead, God comes to people who are desperate and tells them to decorate? It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like enough. Decorations are nice and all, but they hardly serve to make things better. They hardly can be counted on to change the world. Can they? Why do we bother? Are we just shouting in the darkness? Well, yes, in a way we are, but shouting in the darkness is a noble profession. It's a calling. When we shout, when we decorate our homes and our churches, we're not saying that we're unaware of difficulties. We're not saying that we're oblivious to bad news. What we are saying is that we choose to live by good news. We are saying that we choose to live with hope and not despair. And what keeps this from becoming a rose-colored glasses scenario is Isaiah's call to act in hope. The Lord brings the good news. The Lord, through the prophet, proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. But then we are the ones doing the work. We are the ones in charge of binding up hearts, putting people back together in their brokenness. We are the ones who set people free, telling people the good news that Jesus saved us from ourselves. We are the ones who rebuild, working for social justice and equality and love. We work because we believe. We build because we hope. And because we hope, we are blessed. John wants us to hope. Both Johns do, actually. John the Gospel writer and John the Baptist. But John knows that the only way to do that is to look beyond. John the Baptist is introduced in the Gospel as seemingly the first human being in the story. But he's presented in a way as to point beyond himself to the one who is coming. In the Gospel book of John, chapter 1, he writes, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. Well then, who are you? They asked, are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we're expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer. For those who sent us, what do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way, for the Lord is coming. Then the Pharisees, who had been sent, asked him, If you aren't the Messiah, or Elijah, or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? 
John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandal. This encounter took place in Bethany, an area east of the Jordan River, where John was baptizing. John the Baptist came to testify. He came to clear the way for Jesus' arrival. He tells the authorities, I am not the Messiah. This seems like a simple and obvious statement, yet how often do we need to repeat this phrase for ourselves? I'm not the Messiah. It's a good phrase to remember, especially when we add it to the other task that John reveals. He is the one preparing the way. He is the one who can recognize the Messiah when he sees him. He is the one getting people ready. He's decking their halls. Isaiah does it with beauty, blessings, and praise. John does it with water. But it is part of the preparation, part of the declaration, waiting for the one who comes. We, too, are preparing our space, preparing our hearts, preparing our world for the one who comes. With decorations, yes, but mostly we should be preparing with acts of love and service. Our preparation for the company that is coming is proclamation and invitation. We prepare for the coming of the Savior by telling others about him. We prepare by inviting them to spend time getting to know him. We prepare by working as his hands and feet, spreading love and acceptance and joy and light into a world that seems pretty dark right now. We prepare by embracing hope and sharing it with those around us. Are you prepared? Amen. Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. In beauty green, they'll always show through summer sun and winter snow. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, you are the tree most loved. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, you are the tree most loved. How often you give us delight in brightly shine. Christmas light, oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, you are the tree most loved. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, your beauty green will teach me. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, your beauty green will teach me. That hope and love will ever be the way to joy and peace for me. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, your beauty green will teach me. Thank you so much for spending this time together with us today. We hope it's given you some inspiration for your week and to think ahead about the work you're doing on decking your halls. Before we go, though, let's join together in saying our benediction. Who are we? We are a missionary force of Christians. And what do we do? Offer the care and compassion of Christ. To whom? To all. And where do we meet you? Wherever you are on life's journey.
Bye, guys. See you next week.